Hi listeners, Jason here. We are excited to finally announce registrations for the biggest psych health and safety community event ever. The inaugural The Psych Health and Safety Conference will be held at the Sofitel Wentworth Sydney June 19 to 20, 2024 and offer concurrent virtual attendance. It'll feature live podcast recordings with OG researchers, including Christina Maslach and Michael Leiter of Burnout fame, Psych Health and Safety USA podcast host I, David Daniels, Australian super experts, including the likes of David Burrows, a special 10-year anniversary integrated approaches to workplace mental health panel with authors Tony LaMontagna, Angela Martin and Kat Page, handpicked case studies from organisations doing it well, and a very special interview with plaintiff Zaggy Kozarov by Catherine Dunlop on that High Court case which we previously covered on the podcast. This event will sell out. Get in quick to secure tickets at early bird prices for the two-day conference, pre-conference masterclasses and the VIP dinner. The first 200 in-person registrations also get a copy of her latest book, The Burnout Challenge, signed by Christina Maslach herself. Find out more and register at www.psychhealthandsafetyconference.com. Now, on to this episode. In the aftermath of a global pandemic, there has been a greater focus on workplace mental health. However, there are still those who question the reality of this challenge and ask, where is the data? We'll discuss the data and the case for a stronger focus on how people feel at work up next on this episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. As workplace mental health has become a global priority, there's a greater focus on addressing psychosocial hazards. Each episode, we look at psychological safety from an occupational health and safety perspective. Let's talk psych health and safety. Welcome to this week's Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. I'm your host, Dr. I. David Daniels, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Each week, we seek to increase awareness of the importance of psychological health and safety by learning from the lived experiences research, and expertise of our guests, as well as advocating strategies to reduce harm and minimize vulnerability to psychosocial hazards in the American workplace. So this this conversation is about data. And there's a significant amount of data in the United States to suggest that we are destroying innovation, uh, destroying productivity, In some cases, we're violating folks' civil rights and we're fueling a significant mental health crisis. And just a few data points. The U.S. is number one among developed nations for workplace stress, anxiety disorders, psychopathy, psychopathy, uh, antisocial personality disorder, homicide, and suicide in the workplace. 70% of U.S. adults that's approximately 223.5 million people have experienced psychological trauma, increasing their sensitivity to workplace abuse and subsequent mental health disorders. 30% of American workers, or about almost 47 million people, are victims of psychological abuse related to anxiety, depression, PTSD, and again, the spread of uh, sociopathy. Uh, Year-on-year increases in workplace toxicity and harassment is evident. It's clear, with 22% of workers saying that they're subject to a workplace that includes psychological abuse or some form of abuse sometime in the last 12 months. And uh, those are the kind of data points we'll be talking about in this episode. And I'm honored to have someone who's spent some time collecting this data, thinking about it, sharing it with others uh, that I've met and some activities I've been engaged in here recently. And uh, we're just going to get right to it. And we're going to get to it in a way that hopefully shares some information. Hopefully it'll change some minds. Hopefully some of those who are, you know, don't really believe in the warm and fuzzy will believe a little bit more in the facts. So let's get the conversation started with a introduction of my guest by my guest with this question. So who is Torin Monet? Um, It's a good question. Um, (laughs) uh, So the 
Uh, maybe I'll tell a little story to, to make it interesting so it doesn't feel like bullet points. I, I grew up in the Bay Area in California and um, went to UC Santa Cruz, had some pretty idealistic notions about corporations, and then uh, decided that those were probably foolish and, uh, and made me an outsider. And my mom raised me with this notion that if you want to change any system, you have to be inside of it and it has to accept you as part of the system or else you won't have any legitimacy to change the system. Um, and also I left school with, um, with no employable options other than to go into business. So <laughs> I went into business, uh, found it to be reasonably harsh, uh, but a, a place that I, that I worked well when I went to business school and then I ended up in uh, management consulting gravitated towards human, um, experience and organizational structures. And I, I spent time doing that for a good portion of my adult life. And in that I gravitated towards what what worked the best. So I wanted to have efficacy. And I found this thing called psychological safety. It was the only thing that was like really defensible from a improvement to productivity and innovation and uh, profitability standpoint, if you're trying to optimize the humans. So if you look at it through the people process technology standpoint, and you think I want to optimize the humans and, and from a value standpoint, I'm, I'm a person that's interested in optimizing systems. I may come off as pro-social, but I, it's, it's a lot less altruistic in some ways. I'm looking at humanity as a large, complex psychosocial system. I'd like it to be peaceful because I get fussy when, when people are violent. And I'd like it to be uh, innovative and productive engaging because the human experience is um, neurologically at its best in that outcome. So that, that's, the, that's the stuff that turns me on from a value standpoint. And, and I'm an ENTJ, uh, uh, so at heart, my... <laughs> My interest isn't always the warm and fuzzy and my interest is let's get it done. So if we're doing, if we're doing this thing called humanity, let's get it done so that it uh, is a good experience for the humans. Um, and I, I feel like that's a pretty defensible position. I, I find though that in my life, I've run into so many situations that we've built in business that are littered with uh, oversight, psychosocial risks, complete ineptitude in, in terms of um, neuroscience, or social science or sociology or any of these schools of studying humans. So we've built these large complex scaled organizations that build horrible experiences for human beings. There's like unprecedented data about the human experience out of Gallup for most large corporations. So we've made it miserable for ourselves because we're ignorant uh, and the potential to be more productive is phenomenal. So I'm a person who's trying to bring that information together in a cohesive narrative so that people can, um, can change laws and change business practices. That's that's what a lot of my career has been about um, more recently, and a lot of my outside of work advocacy has been about. Okay, wow, so much, so much to dig into. Let's uh, let me ask you one more of my standard uh, questions. So, <laughs> what what does psychological health and safety mean to you? It means that when a person comes into the work experience, I usually use the, um, the metrics around I'd say it's vulnerability, uh, it's trust, it's inclusion, it's, it's the sub-dimensions of psychological safety. So if I take a, a properly defensible psychologist diagnostic from Amy Edmondson or one of the thought leaders about psychological safety. And I come in and I ask those questions in your workplace and your scores are great. Then you've created a psychologically safe workplace and that's fantastic. And if the scores are, are, are not great or are terrible against national benchmarks, then um, you've got some stuff to fix. So a bit overly simplified and I'm not even, there are probably two major tiers that I think of it in. There's or maybe three, three major tiers. There's below the line, which is I'm causing mental health issues. I'm, I'm damaging humanity at scale. That's where we are. There's above the line, which is foundational psychological safety, which is fantastic. That means people aren't being uh, abused and, and scared in the workplace. Granted, some of us, me included, are probably a little more sensitive than other people. So you toss us into the workplace and we're more likely to go, oh, I'm uncomfortable. And then there's probably above that threshold, which is uh, people operating in peak cognitive function, high innovation. Corporations want this don't always understand how to do this and are generating this. Wow. Wow. That's, that's what the data says. It's not my critique. And I, 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 
I can say that as a practitioner who's played across the Fortune 500, I'm a management consultant, I spend time inside of those corporations. And I can say that as um, persons who run the, uh, the analytics and as defensible data, and I can say that as somebody who's looked at macro data that's been collected uh, across the nation obsessively and has looked at the fundamental psychological research on the impacts of those types of behaviors in, in the workplace. So I, I feel like I've looked at it from a lot of ways. I, you know, I, I, just listening to you talk about this. So, so as I share with a lot of guests that I have on the podcast, it is in the United States, or maybe I should just say for me, it's been difficult sometimes for me to find people who have dug into this concept of psychological safety past the, you know, the, the flowery kinds of, you know, things that it, it's trendy to talk about it these days. And I, I think it, it's a very trendy thing and, and so appreciate Dr. Edmondson's work, but there are a lot of people who've gone, they, they read her book and they go, Oh, that's it. And it's just perfect. And let's just kind of waltz in. And again, you know, to, pass out the fruit bowls and have the, you know, the yogurt and the exercise class, and it's going to be wonderful. And often folks doing that, do it well-intentioned, to be quite honest, well-intentioned, trying to do the right thing, but they don't realize that the very systems that they are baked in, that they are a part of every day, are producing this challenge that you're trying to, to deal with. It, it, it's in the water, it's in the air, it's everywhere. Because that's how it was designed in the first place. I say often that every system is perfectly designed to produce whatever it's currently producing. And it was set up. There are many, many systems that are set up to, on the one hand, they did they made the binary choice between, you know, make money and everything else. And they chose the make money part, so everything else suffers. As long as it makes money, it's okay. And it, it, it is a, an exploitive, you know, horrible experience for some people. It isn't for everybody, and so I'm not. Uh, this is I'm not here to critique whether or not it's good or bad. I'm just saying it's not a healthy situation for everybody because it wasn't really designed to be. And so I, I, I wonder, was there a particular thing that got you interested in this conversation on work around workplace mental health? Was there a, an experience of yourself or, or of other people, or so? How did you end up interested in this topic in general? Um. That's a, a lovely question. Uh, it gets it gets more personal, um, but, and I think anybody that's been in corporate America for long enough it experiences this. So, in corporate America, for those who don't live in it, and for those who live in it, little reminders: about ten percent of our workforce is subclinical psychopathy. And if you go into the um, more competitive spaces where there's more money to be made, those are magnets for those personality types. And sometimes people are able to regulate those behaviors. I'm not looking down on them or judging. I have some of those behaviors myself. I mean, abuse a jerk. Um, but I try and regulate those behaviors because they cause mental illness in other people. And the, the big ask, I think, is if you have an inclination towards aggressive behaviors uh, when you're under stress, learn to recognize them and learn to regulate them. And I had experiences in my career where I worked with people who either didn't want to or were unable to regulate those behaviors. So you have it. That's a really classic example you have somebody uh tear you up um behind closed doors that's a like in my in my generation that's really standard some somebody comes in they just they just you know say the meanest most horrible things they possibly can there's no repercussions to them and that's acceptable and and was acceptable in the time they grew up um uh level you know next level might be people that are actively engaged in um in your uh, demise professionally. So that's somebody who's really committed to behind the scenes, um, sowing the seeds of discontent or, or making sure that, um, that you look terrible, so undermining. Um, and then you've got people who are probably a level above that. I put them in kind of the Jedi stack. And those are people who build a strong relationship with you with the intention of feeling you out and then uh, using information against you, uh, both directly through psychological abuse or indirectly through kind of mobbing tactics or any kind of second order of use. And if you see those things happen um, from many dimensions, as a perpetrator, as a uh, victim, as a bystander, as a member of the mob over the years, 
you understand how the system works experientially and very intimately. So when I talk about these topics, I'm not like some outsider that goes, this is not this is mean and I don't like it and it made me feel bad and I'm fussy about it. I'm talking about it as somebody who's been every part of that system for my adult life. And if you wanna you know, put me on the stand in front of Congress and we talk about these things, I can talk about them in intimate psychological ways. I can also talk about them from a neuroscience perspective. I can talk about them from a uh, social science perspective. I can talk about them from a business practices perspective. And I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm, I am saying that we have a system and it has inputs and outputs and it's creating uh, mental health issues at scale nationally. Like the, the things that stick out to me are that some of the figures you said in the beginning, 30% or 47 million people are victims of psychological abuse that's perpetrated by 4% of the population. So that means there are 4% of people going into work who are willing to like write on a survey that they do this and say, hey, you know, go through the day and sometimes I mess with people. I like to like to poke people, especially like to poke people, people that have kind of like, you know, tendency to get more irritated because I get the way I'm built, I get a little bit of a like, oh, I'm, I've got some power there. Um, and the problem is when we do that, we generate 20%, 28% increase in depression, 34% increase in anxiety, and 30%, 37% increase in stress-related mental health disorders. And if we do it for a long time, we get 230% higher rates of heart disease and 420% higher rates of depression. And we have a nation that has a mental health crisis that's recognized by our US Surgeon General who has said psychological safety is a number one priority for workplaces. So if we can connect the data we can start fixing the problem. All that means is having people moderate their antisocial inclinations and not generating mental health issues at scale. Wow. Uh, it, again, it is so fascinating to hear you talk about something that is so widespread, so devastating to so many people in such a, almost a clinical kind of way. Because I, I, I think one of the challenges with having conversations around this topic is that sometimes those of us, and I'll put myself in this category as well, some of us that talk about it come across as sometimes not clinical enough and way too, quote unquote, emotional. And, and, and there are those that as soon as you look, you know, emotional, they kind of turn off the conversation because that's soft, that's, you know, that, that's not, that doesn't really that didn't really help us get anywhere. And, and, and so, again, I just appreciate the, the ability to be able to take this and just be very factual about, sure, about yeah. it. Because, again, whether people like it or not in terms of the conversation, it is what it is. The, the facts are there. The data is there. And they're big numbers. They're, they're, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're a they're, crisis for a nation. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh. It, so, 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 again, you, you, you describe this as a crisis for the nation. Tell me a little bit more about why you feel like it's 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 a it's a crisis. Well, why? You, yeah, it's a, um, it's it's uh, it gets all the way down into families. So if you if you look at the data uh, past what happens in the workplace, and you start looking at the data in terms of what's happening at home, you start looking at abuse rates, and you start looking at um, youth, uh, youth homicide rates, and you start looking at youth suicide rates, and you start looking at youth depression rates and youth anxiety rates, you see this weird combination, and it has to do with overall stress levels and anxiety and desperation. You see a nation that's, uh, that's more stressed out than it's ever been. Uh, you see the parents showing that in data sets. Then you see their children at home starting to exhibit all the signs of a very, very stressed out parental structure and, and acting out in all these horrible ways. So what's happening is we're creating a cascade that starts wherever people go all day or whatever they experience all day and gets down into the family. And when you do that, you start breaking the system of stability and health and love and support and all those good things that we like to preach about in our ideals about, um, about the family. Um, and now you've got multi-generational transfer of trauma and you're, you're doing it in this, this almost elegant cascade down to youth in the most, uh, vulnerable points in human development, the points that when we do therapy on ourselves, we go back to and we go, oh, 
that moment. That's what made me so over rotated that way. And I think it's hard to get the American public's attention, but once you start talking about uh, breaking our entire way of life, you might have some attention. We clearly don't care that much about children killing each other based on our tolerance for school violence. So that, that wasn't an area that I choose to highlight usually when we talk about these issues. The only thing that really seems to move the needle are threats to innovation, productivity, and profitability. So I, I lean back there and I go, <laughs> I go, this, this national threat that's having all these problems and causing, you know, the worst experience and transfer of trauma, so forth, is terrible, but it's terrible because it threatens productivity and innovation and profitability. And, and that seems to be where the power structure cares about it. So if we have a psychologically safe environment in the workplace, we improve productivity by 50%, we improve innovation by 150%, we improve profitability by 10%. That's profound. So we have a mental health crisis. I don't think the nation cares enough about it. We had one of our candidates actually running as part of this platform to address the national mental health crisis. I think that fell off the ticket. I think we're going to go back to having uh, two parties that um, are sure they're right uh, and are sure they represent um, the populace, but I think that they represent kind of extremes and loud versions of the populace. I've looked at the, the data on that too. And uh, if you look at the Pew research data on the way our population experienced the different crises that we're going through, um, they're fed up, they're fed up with the, the, all the possibilities for candidates, et cetera. But now I'm, now I'm on a different soapbox that I don't belong on. <laughs> I try and stay on the soapbox. I know something about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, you know, there are, um, again, there are a lot of days that, that I, I feel very similarly and, and, you know, and make those comments. I, I, I honestly, so when I, you know, I did a little research on psychosocial hazard exposure and, um, mm -hmm. honestly believe that we as human beings, uh, adaptability is one of the, you know, the things that makes us, you know, like, like most you know, species makes us, keeps us surviving. So we're able to adapt. Uh, the challenge is it's really difficult to adapt to something when we are not even convinced it exists. So it's hard to adapt to it. It's hard to even deal with. So we don't really, we're having these kind of negative outcomes and haven't made the connection that, yeah, it's, it's that thing that you said was normal. That's actually contributing to the problem you say that you want to eradicate. And I just find it, interesting that uh, these the, the the ways in which we treat each other in the workplace and at home have been so normalized over time that I just think that's just kind of the way it is. And I, uh, I'd, be inter I'd be interested. We're, in from, we're from that generation. We're from that generation. I grew up in a, a time when uh, my father uh, was fourth generation violence. Like he was in war. His father was in war. His father was in war. His father was in war. I mean, look at epigenetics. I'm probably going to be more inclined to be a little bit more hostile. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah. What was your question? I'm sorry. I well, well, I, I, I guess that you know you're, <laughs> you're kind of heading there anyway. I, I guess I there's a part of me that wonders, has it really been this way for you know a good percentage of human history, uh, and we're just figuring it out, or is it really getting worse? I mean, it's kind of a binary type. Yeah. Thing. Well, oh, what's your, wow. what's your thought? Has yeah. it really? Do we just know now know more about the challenge that we've probably already had, or are there reasons to suggest no? It actually is a little worse. Or yeah, what, again, what's your thought on that? Uh, let me let me talk about micro and macro timeframes. So uh, zooming out, we'll go macro, and I, I can't say the TED talk because I can't remember who did it, but it was something that generally things are getting safer. Fair. Set that to the side. We're not hitting each other on the head with clubs anymore. Agreed. There isn't like rampant uh, chaos in the streets every day. Concede. Um, what I've looked at more recently is the uh, FBI data about violence. Let's let's look at homicide. Let's look at um, indications that things are problematic. And some of that data more recently, I'll take I'll take school shootings and overall homicide. That's trending up phenomenally in the near term. And you know, you could you could take some of the larger critiques and say, well, that's a that's a function of the 
uh, amount of adult males in the population of certain risk ages and certain socioeconomic communities that have density towards homicide. I, we could say that, okay. Um, talk to me about school shootings. Um, and the, the reason I, I bring multiple data points together is because it paints a picture that's that says more about uh, who we're becoming. So if we have rates of, so, of psychopathy that are, and we benchmark against other countries, we have rates of psychopathy that are higher than the other developed nations. We have rates of homicide that are higher than the developed nations. And if you line up the bar charts of the developed nations for homicide and for sociopathy, there's a really strong connection. <laughs> if you've got a bunch of psychopaths running around or people with a tendency towards psychopathy, there's a tendency that they're going to act. Uh, move over to school shootings. If you have a population of people that are acting in psychopathic ways and a culture that is very psychopathic and glorifies violence on a regular basis, you have children that go into schools or adults that go into schools and shoot children. Um, and that's, that's not a silly coincidence. That's what we've created. So I go back to your earlier comment about systems. We have outputs and nobody seems to be interested in the data. And the data is very, to me is very, uh, very available. If you sit for a year and just do research, just look at fundamental psychology research and neuroscience research, look at how the human brain works, and you sit down and you look at the data about what we're doing and you're only interested in violence. Like how do I solve this puzzle called violence? And if you're super lazy and you don't want to do any of that stuff and you want to collect a lot of data points together, Use AI, use GPT-4, ask it, hey, school shootings, what's the you know 20 point plan to solving that? And what's causing it? And it'll make a, a and, and tell it to cite all its um, uh, resources and then go read those resources. It'll start to connect the dots. I think we're, to your earlier question about, um, is it getting worse or is it getting better? I'd say it's getting worse in the near term in the US. Do you need more psych health and safety in your life? then head over to the Flourish GX Academy for several free on-demand e-learning courses. If you're an internal professional, follow Flourish GX on Eventbrite to register for any of our free fortnightly interactive webinars. Our flagship professional practice program is also exclusively available for internal professionals. The 12-week course blends theory, applied practice and interaction with other professionals through live lectures and a monthly community of practice session. Find out more about all these learning opportunities or inquire about a bespoke in-house training at the Flourish DX Academy, www.45003.org. Now back to this episode. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the, one of the ways that I think about it, because again, I, I can't say that I've looked at, you know, the outputs as much as I've tried to look at, you know, again, the, just the existence of the hazard itself. It's a, it's a, it's a small point, but I think it's, it's one of the more critical. And so my, my definition of a psychosocial hazard is a psychosocial factor that's perceived or experienced by the person exposed as a threat that motivates them to behave in a particular way. We see there are threats, there are hazards out there all the time that we do not live in a hazard free environment because you can't. The, the, the issue is the, I'm not vulnerable to all those hazards, so I don't, it doesn't cause me to really do anything. Because for me, that potential threat is so remote that I, there's no need for me to modify my behavior. But, 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 but when we get into the workplace, so you talked about earlier about that person who is okay kind of poking at people. That's the thing that they do because that's, what's, you know, that's what gets them going. That's what gets them it's almost the excited. Being in senior leadership. Yeah, like, absolutely. A absolutely. It's that, you know, the, the, the closer you get to the top, the kind of the more of it you see because of the, you know, the almost overly competitive nature to be able to get there. But because these folks think that that's normal, folks around them who don't see that the same way are identified as, well, they're not leadership material. They don't fit. Uh, we're not sure if they're going to be able to do this work. So, and, and again, folks with that kind of, you know, that really interesting, you know, kind of, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to say that nicely. I guess I can't. They're, they're, they're kind of psychopaths. They get into these positions of leadership and then they design systems that reinforce, you know, that the idea that in order to be a leader, you have to be a psychopath. You have to be angry. You have to scream a lot. Again, I, I spent, you know, a lot of years in the fire rescue service and a lot of those folks uh, were, you know, ex-military people who brought their aggression into the fire rescue service to be able to, 
you know, and, and, and they sought positions of leadership that would allow them to be in control of other people and gives them an excuse to yell and scream at other people and say, well, I was just only doing that because it was an emergency. Well, an emergency for who was an emergency for me. That's something we used to talk about is that, so just because I'm at a house that's on fire, it's not an emergency for me. It's an emergency for the person who's, so why am I screaming and yelling? Why am I yelling at other people that I brought to try to take care of this issue? I, we're trying I, to make good decisions. We're trying to make good decisions. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> and and be, be, because, uh, and again, many of, much of this, I didn't recognize at all when I was active. I was simply doing what everybody else did. But by me, you know, and I, I didn't tend to be a yeller and a screamer because I didn't think it was really all that cool. But um, but the yellows and screamers, so you trigger me. As soon as you yell at me, my amygdala fires up and I'm looking for the next threat coming in. Like, so I'm, I'm not making my best decisions. I can't because that part of my brain is totally shut down. And and, again, and so I, I say all that to say that in business, uh, in industry, in education, in healthcare, you pick the industry. As soon as we trigger people by these aggressive, what I perceive to be aggressive behaviors, what I uh, perceive to be threatening to me in some way, shape, or form, then you're not getting the best out of me at all. You're getting what's left. You'll get what I share. And, I, and, and I'll say this and see what you think about it. The conversations about psychological safety sound good, but I can't bring my whole self to a system that wasn't built to accept me when I get there. So when I actually do the thing, you said you want my whole self. So my whole self is, you know, is has a faith tradition of I'm, I'm Wiccan or I'm, I'm, I'm or I, you know, t t think of something else that is kind of outside the quote unquote mainstream. And as soon as I display that, then I get labeled and set aside and, you know, kicked out of the group. So why not be honest and say, you want me to bring the parts of me that are going to help us do what we're trying to do and not tell me to bring all myself. Because you're not built for all of me. I, I mean, I, I, am I am I missing something there? Because this talk again, it, it it sounds really good, but these systems have not been built to uh, to 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 minimize the abuse, and they've not been built that way in the first place. And I think in a lot of cases, we simply need to start from scratch. We need more new businesses. We need no new, more new policies. We, the, the ones that we have aren't ever going to get us there in my opinion yeah so that's that's the elephant in the room i i had a conversation uh a couple of years back where i was talking through all these dynamics that we talked about in the workplace and one of the senior people on the call said well if we run people super hot and scared their amygdala is triggered all the time and uh they're going to make low quality decisions and i am like they're going to be selfish like from self-focused decisions, so they be self-referential, and they're basically going to be dumb. You want to make people dumb. And the person said, well, I guess we're going to have to run people really differently. Like we're going to have to run them a little slower because they're mortals, they're humans. Um, and I was like, yeah. And, and, and it, was, it was almost like the, it was the elephant in the room. It was the, the thing that nobody wanted to say, that humans aren't designed to be run hot all the time. Even people are high psychopathy. So people are high psychopathy they might they might get calm in the chaos, but if you if you run them nonstop, their decision quality is not great. It's actually pretty bad because um, they're still humans. So the systems that we've created, as you say, are optimized for the people in power to stay in power and to make it less of a power struggle and not threatening. I think the conversation needs to be really collaborative and say, hey, look, if you're high psychopathy and you're driven to be in control of things, that's what brings you pleasure. That's that's great. You're willing to work very hard. High, high psychopathy people willing to work very hard. Um, that's great. But if you're in charge of people, we need you to regulate the part of your personality that, that uh, maybe uh, leans towards malignant or sadism or paranoia. Because those are the, like we look at the personality types to watch out for. We've got kind of malignant narcissists and subclinical psychopaths and people high paranoid. If you can regulate that part of your personality in a way that makes it so you're not uh, deeply psychologically abusive in a way that causes mental illness at scale to the people that are subordinate to you, that's great. We're going to um, measure that, though, and you're going to be accountable. And there was a paper I posted recently about that said, how do you get the value out of high psychopathy people without the damage to your entire uh, uh, corporation and country? And it simply said, to sum it up bluntly, laws, policies, and transparency. 
And this is where the story gets exciting for me. When you bring these proposals, having brought these proposals for many years to corporations, they're interested in the ideals. And then once you get to transparency, they are terrified. And it's the, it's the uh, brings us to probably a really pressing issue, which is they're terrified because if that data is out, they're not sure if they're on the right side of the law in stopping the abuse or if they're on the right side of the law in ignoring it and burying it. And if there was clear legal guidance, clear laws about this stuff, then corporations could act decisively and they could say, oh, we're not on the side of abuse. Um, and they could make the, the data transparent, but currently, if you work in large corporations, you say, hey, I'd really love to see the human experience data across the corporation because, you know, I've got some mental health issues. I'm pretty sensitive to psychological abuse, but I want to find a place in the corporation where I can feel safe and fit in in a manager that um, won't generate anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, and heart disease and all these things. Uh, and they'll, they'll say, we, we won't share that data with you. That's private. You might ask, why not? And you'll never get a good answer. Um, they're all empty answers because human experience data means that you care about the humans that are involved in the endeavor. Uh, and those people are having a hard time. And the macro data that Gallup prints uh, says that. And the micro data in corporations across the nation is opaque. So I think the answer isn't even to make a, a moral statement about it, but it's to require from a health standpoint that large corporations, in addition to releasing their asbestos count and other physical hazards, like you might die on the job working in the soil rig, um, that they release their psychological hazards. Hey, you, you come work at our investment bank, but fair disclosure, you may end up with post-traumatic stress disorder and a fear of walking into office buildings and you know some other, <laughs> some other things. And then let people decide based on how bad or good the data is where they want to be because Let's say I am high psychopathy. And let's say it doesn't bother me that much when somebody is scowling at me and yelling at me because, you know, I'm gonna scowl and yell at them back and we can scowl and yell at each other, it's great. Um, I can go work in that environment and we can psychopath out. It's gonna be fantastic. In fact, we might be a, a force to, to be reckoned with. Uh, and and then another person might be, I'm really interested in bringing my whole mind to work. I'm very innovative. I'm a programmer. I'm really interested in purpose. And I want to be in a place where I feel really safe and nobody attacks me. And I want to come in and have serenity. So you walk into some of these Bay Area technology companies and the worker, the engineers are treated like gods. They're in this place of serenity. Nobody's allowed to speak angrily at them. And, and they track the data about how they're treated all the time. So there's that. You, you brought up something, though, that I can't not talk about. Um, at the top of the house is the corporate structure. And we built the C Corp. And if you examine the C Corp, there are books about this, but if you examine the C Corp, it's a psychopathic entity. It exists to achieve profit, even at the cost of humanity and the environment, as long as it isn't breaking the law. And that's structurally how it's set up. And it's required that the officers of that corporation do that. If they have any other agenda that possibly undermines that, threatens that, doesn't do that for a second, they can be held liable or responsible. So, so the, the B Corp is adjacent, making B Corps, public good corps that uh, have an edict to care about the uh, larger human population is probably where we need to go. Making C Corps is probably not appropriate anymore, especially for Gen Z. That's a point of view. Wow. Yeah. I, I, again, having been a, a public sector guy most of my career uh, and, no, and, and even now, you know, my, there, there are some, uh, I'm I'm probably never going to be a bazillionaire because I don't really care about the money that much. I just don't. I I, I don't. I, I don't. It's not important enough to me. To there are some folks I just won't really work with at all. And again, not because I'm saying they're bad people. That's just not an environment I want to be in. I don't. You know, I don't relish being in an environment where either I or the people that I or I see other people that are being mistreated. That's just that just doesn't work for me. And it, and it took it took therapy actually to get to the point to where I could realize again to your point that there are some folks that to them that's what gets them up in the morning that and, and and as long as they can be around other people like that you know there's a part of me that says that's probably okay that's a choice that they both made but again to another point that you made I just wish we could be a little bit more objective and a little bit more transparent about it 
and simply tell, for example, so there is this thing called equal opportunity employment that says that, you know, anybody who wants to come and get this job will, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I wish some of them would just be honest to say, as long as you're a, and then fill in the blank, because there is nothing, nothing about the structure of your organization. There's nothing about the people that you hire. There's nothing that suggests that you're serious about it. Nothing. You say that, oh yeah, we'd love to have, you know, in my case, love to have people of color here. And I don't ever see any. So why don't you just be honest and say, that's, that's not, you know, we don't think it's going to be psychologically safe for a person of color here. And, and, and frankly, it's a private business. That's okay. And then you know, that means you're willing to take the chance that those of us who are people of color, who have skill, who have money, who have all, may or may not do business with you. And I, I'm honest, as a part of me, says I'm really okay with that. I'm, I'm okay. But, 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 but we say just the opposite. Oh, yeah, we're open. We, so we want everybody to be here and everybody to be, you know, to, to feel like they're a part of the, of the process until I actually try to do it. And then I find out, and then I, or I talk to other people who've tried to do it and you treat them horribly. So why would you think I'd do that? And this is where I just love, I, I want to say, I want to believe I was a Gen Z or born, a, you know, 30 or 40 years too early. Um, but um, I just really love their, their, they're smarter than that. They're just not, they're not going to do it. Well, I, I, matter of fact, I have a, someone I'll, I'll, I'll talk to here fairly soon. Uh, there are folks out there who are their consulting practices, teaching Gen Zers how not to go into those kinds of businesses and environments, teaching them how to do other things that are lower stress, uh, that aren't going to require, you know, the, the, the four-year degree and the $150,000 in debt. That there's an entire conversation going on right now. And so I honestly believe that a lot of these, particularly larger organizations, will eventually find it difficult to get the very people that they say they want because they haven't create the, created the environment for those folks to feel safe doing it. And you're still, you got a bunch of 60, 70, and 80 somethings making, you know, all the decisions and telling people what the, how things are supposed to be and not listening to others who just see it different. They're not deficient. They just see it different. You're, you're going to it. No, no, I, 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 I just, I, I just find it really interesting uh, that that folks think that this is going to last long term. While you know, while we're watching society change as quickly as it has, particularly in the last you know few years uh, since we all experienced the uh, exposure to a global biological hazard called COVID nineteen. I mean, people have figured out that you know, I. I I actually feel safer not going into that environment. Working remotely works fine for me. And a lot of the reasons that some folks work remote is that the environment that they were in, even years beforehand, it was toxic. They were being, you know, emotionally abused. The abusers have, the systems have gotten smarter and they won't punch you in the mouth or take you out in the back and beat you up, but they emotionally beat you up. And, and we have a safety related system and that's you know my area of expertise that requires companies to disclose when people are physically injured and has very little requirement for you to disclose when people are emotionally injured so systems have gotten they've adapted so again we can't break your arm or your leg you know we can but we can break your spirit and we can do it with Reckless abandon and no one will hold us accountable for it. And that's that's that is fueling much of the data that that you know you've you shared and, and talked about a little bit earlier. Hmm. So um what should we do? I think we need to curtail um the behaviors. So the at the core of all of this is uh incentive structures and personality disorders. And if you're looking at it from a systems perspective, the things that work based on the research to curtail the behaviors of the personality disorders are transparency and policy. So I think we make transparent the data about human experience and let talent decide where it wants to go. And, and that, that makes it less of a moral argument 
That just means that we're, from a public health and safety standpoint, providing the public with information that it can use to protect its health, which is a function of the public sector. Um, and it's also very easy to do. Writing a digital survey and having that data transparently reported to the public and in a format that the public can mine with a conversational algorithm front end interface, that's easy. That's really easy. So if a corporation were to say, oh, that's too hard, that's, that's going to encumber us. Like the corporations we're talking about are you know, multi-billion dollar corporations, this is a pittance. Um, what they may find is that the data is incredibly empowering. Like they can use it to attract and retain the best people in the world. So that's, that's probably the biggest thing that we need to do. Adjacent to that, uh, we probably need to change corporate structures fundamentally. And this is a larger issue that is the elephant in the room. The reason that we can fix uh, environmental um, and social impacts, the reason we can't support the United Nations sustainability goals effectively with our corporate sectors, because our corporate sector is designed to not give a damn about those outcomes at all. So we do need to change the corporate structures to care about those. And that would be the difference between having a office of sustainability and you know public good in your corporation, that's a, a bit of a sideshow, and having the central reason for your corporation exist to be its mission and the betterment of humanity. So if we're building these giant structures that control all the power and resources in humanity, it seems a little misguided that we wouldn't build them to also protect the species. I mean, we're running into an ethical consideration right now with um, ChatGPT and Elon Musk and the rights that uh, Microsoft has. And the ethical consideration is we had a nonprofit that was making a public good device. Uh, and now it's going to be run with a for-profit motive. And if it's that powerful and changing to the course of the species and all of consciousness and humanity, um, maybe that shouldn't be in the hands of a of a large corporation that has just a profit motive. Maybe that that won't go great, or maybe it needs to have a lot of controls around it from a, a public safety standpoint. But that's a it's a much deeper discussion. So the the short answer would be make this stuff transparent uh, and make human experience transparent around psychological safety in the workplace and mental health issues. Survey people, make that data available so that people can choose which corporations to go to. Wow. So I'm a as we uh, you know start to wrap up our conversation, so if you were having this discussion with a uh, a singular organization uh, that has decided, you know, there we really want to be able to attract you know top talent and all that type of thing. We don't think there's going to be a law uh, at least any time soon. We think it'll happen, but I think it's going to be a cup. When I say time soon, in the, in the next you know year to eighteen months, it might take a number of years to get where, you know, some of us really want to go. But there are some folks who are innovators, some folks who want to be on the edge, who want to, you know, we want to get this started right away. What, what are some things that they can do uh, right away to, to start changing what's going on in their organizations? So that's a great question. I'd say start surveying internally uh, and start training internally. So right now there's a, like a lot of large corporations use Skillsoft uh, to train people so they don't perpetrate psychological abuse in the workplace. The, the um, module is garbage. It's grossly unsophisticated and it wouldn't stop the behavior. So you need to train people so they don't behave in a certain way and make really clear to everybody what the impacts of those behaviors are. This is a behavior. This is what it looks like. This is the kind of mental health disorders it causes. We've got corporations that don't understand how to handle that fundamental training and that's normal. And then second to that, uh, run internal surveys, um, check in to see what the mental health is, psychological abuse behaviors, and psychological safety behaviors are. Those are things you can define very easily working with a mental health professional or um, forensic psychologist or, or just an um, uh, con internal consultant. And then act on the data. If there's bad data somewhere and, and people are being abused, Go change that. And if somebody isn't able to regulate their abusive behavior, they probably shouldn't be in a, a people management position because they're causing mental illness at scale. That wow. Uh that seems very simple. And and hopefully. Wow. Uh who knew? It was so simple. It was just 
Yeah, I'll, make, yeah. I'll make it even simpler. If you don't want to do any of the things I suggested and you're a large Fortune 500 corporation, you collect employee experience data with the Gallup Q12, which is very popular, the most popular in the world. There are two things that you can look at. One question is, my boss cares about me like a human, like a person. That's the question. It is literally a question of dehumanization, it's literally a psychological abuse method. Um, and if the scores are very low underneath a certain leader, that means that's a pocket of dehumanization which is a form of psychological abuse. So now you know you already have the data, you just have to look at it and act on it. The other question is, uh, I feel comfortable um, I think speaking up or uh, I feel comfortable at work. Basically it's a um, proxy for, I feel comfortable bringing my whole self to work, um, being speaking up and, and, and feeling like, like I can be a free human being. And regardless of whether people are in the workplace, most people are low professionals or working remote. That means whether or not somebody can speak up during a call, which is a, a really standard psych safety measure. So look for that data, see where it's low against the global average or national averages, and then go investigate and, and change the behaviors. Well, there we go. There we go. Uh, Torin, thank you so much. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh, for this is a, this is a kind of geek session that I could really get into, uh, but uh, but but uh, like all great things, uh, we have to, you know, have to move on to other things at some point. But again, thank you so much for sharing this uh, information, uh, some of the data points that you shared. Um, again, hopefully, there's some some folks out there who are watching and listening who are like, you know what, that actually sounds doable to me. That sounds like something that we'd be interested in because we really do care about the human being. So. Uh, if you're watching this episode on the uh, Flourish DX YouTube page, please do like, subscribe, and share with your friends. If you're watching or listening to the podcast for the first time, welcome. Hopefully something that you heard will bring you back to an episode in the future. Our previous episodes of the podcast can be found at psychhealthandsafetyusa.com. And uh, we're certainly encouraging you to become a part of the Psych Health and Safety USA movement by connecting to us on LinkedIn. Thanks so much for this conversation and we'll look forward to the next one on the next episode of the psych health and safety usa podcast thanks very much for joining tune in each friday for new episodes of the psych health and safety usa podcast if you have a story or know of one that needs to be told reach out to us on linkedin or send an email to david at id2-solutions.com or go to the Flourish DX website at flourishdx.com. We'll see you next time.